Welcome to Every Step Podcast. I'm Christina Weston. And I'm Judith Beck. Every Step is the podcast where career and life meet. Well, today we are going to be talking about Show Me the Money, and this is part two. So I'm really excited about this, Christina, because we also have a special guest, Luke Farr from The Luke Farr Show. Hi, Luke. Welcome hello, hello. back Thank you again. And it, really, everything money, I mean, really, bonuses are exactly what it says. It's a bonus. If you get it, it's a bonus. But how do you set it? How do you set it in your current role? How do you set a bonus uh, when you're going for a new role or in a contract as the employee or even as the employer for your team? So we're going to talk about everything bonus and contracts today, and hopefully we can um, shed some light on what we've experienced over our years and uh, pass on some uh, tips for you. So how are you going, Christina? You've had mm. lots of bonuses, I'm sure, in your Oh, look, I, you know, bonuses are one of those challenging, challenging areas because they're not guaranteed. And I think that's a that's a big part of it. We're talking about negotiating packages. And we touched on this a little bit in, in episode one, is your base salary is something you can always rely on. But the bonus, to your point, is exactly what it says. And even sometimes when you think you've banked the bonus in your head, the bonus doesn't actually materialise in, in real life. Um, yes, exactly. So, yeah, and, and in terms of employees having control over their bonus, Certainly in terms of some of that negotiation, but a lot of it is is done in large organisations. It's all trickle down. you got no control. It's just this is it, take it or leave it. But if you're going into a new job, you better be aware of the structures and how they work and how, they, how they're applied so that Absolutely. you can actually calculate your total REM. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, as far as control, um, I think you you always have a little bit of control over it. I mean, if you're negotiating a package, depends on the timing. So if you're going into, your, let's say, a review at review time and you ha- aren't on a bonus structure, but you want to be on a bonus structure, then it's very important to do some simple things that you can do. And that's, you know, researching what's the market paying in similar roles and knowing your worth and also understanding, you know, your company's performance, because that comes with what we spoke about last That's week. That's exactly. The timing, the t- timing and, and look at um, what you think the KPI should be on that goal. Don't go into that meeting blind, go in there with some facts and some figures and suggestions and be prepared to be a little flexible and brainstorm it if you have to as well with your boss. Have yeah. that conversation as a business person. I deserve a bonus because of these reasons. And this is how I see that I can get there, which is a little bit different than negotiating one if you're going into a new role with a new company. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But what's been your experience, Luke? Yeah, yeah, great topic. Uh, I guess my my, uh, 15 years throughout the corporate world, this is before going out, contracting, yeah, I think a lot a lot of it for me really came down to understanding my stakes, um, doing my due diligence and thorough research, um, defining the goals, not only my goals, but their goals, trying to understand their goals, trying to really understand how it can be a mutually beneficial scenario. Um, and then more importantly, I think really assessing your negotiation limits. Some people take it a little far, you know, um, so that, you know, there are limits with, with that um, negotiation strength and power. So, yeah, yeah, it's, um, yeah, a lot of learnings that I've had over the, the past 15 years. That's really well, interesting, that kind of subtlety around that negotiation power. <laughs> it's kind of like reading the room or, or negotiating on the sale of a house or whatever. And we've just gone through a, through negotiating the sale of a house and, like, you never actually quite know how far to push it. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah yeah i guess i guess i guess, I guess uh, you can only take the shot and they can only say no right <laughs> well that's so that's that's exactly that's exactly the point um so even if if you don't don't believe you have the power in the situation what's the worst that can happen right they're just yeah. gonna say no and yeah, then you're exactly. back to where you were anyway is yeah, that exactly. such a bad outcome yeah 100 percent. yeah and I, I mean with a house uh, 
knowing you know how many potential buyers are coming through and understanding the market and then assessing that and going well okay we've got some wriggle room here and we've got some bartering between let's say three to five buyers let's uh I don't know, raise the roof. Yeah, but if you like you you translate that to job interviews and we'll go back, we'll kind of go into the the kind of negotiating piece as an employee, you're against a whole bunch of other people too, and you don't know what they're already on. And you don't yeah. Like, this, yeah. That's yeah. why your networking is important and knowing, you know, having your um basically um hand on your on the pulse, knowing what's going on and what and what is the norm and what's mm -hmm. out there. Um, I think one of the biggest things that uh, and questions that I've received <clears throat> is that what happens when um, you've met all your targets, you're in a sales team and you've met all your targets, but the rest of the sales team haven't met their sales targets and your bonus is dependent upon the whole sales team performing and they've dropped the ball, but you haven't. How do you how do you get out of that? How do you present your what happens then? Should you be paid your full bonus? What happens? What do you think should happen? <laughs> what well, should got, that person I, do? I got, I got I got a lot to talk about there from yeah anecdotal experience. But did you did you want to kick off in there uh, and then I'll um I'll jump in. Do you want to start, Christina? Oh, it's Christina. She's gone. Right, on. Well, she's, yeah, she's gone she, on coffee break. That's fine. Um, yeah. I'll, uh, so. Yeah, for me. Sorry, had a barking dog. Had to deal with it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's important and and quite relevant to the topic at hand here, Christina. Because uh, when you're in a sales team and you're contributing, but your team aren't, there's there's you're you become a barking dog. <laughs> that's exactly. And you become a barking dog because you you've uh, you've hit all your KPIs, like Judah said, but your team hasn't. I mean, at at the end of the day, though. Um, from my experience, it's if 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 you're if you're the manager, right? I'm, this is only what I've anecdotally experienced. The manager at hand, and I was managing a team of five uh, eventually, but that, that when when you are the manager, you uh, even uh, uh, like part of your role, and only pro well part of my twenty percent of my role was selling, eighty percent was uh, managing and leadership functions, and so. When the team hasn't hit their target, that does fall upon me, and therefore that's uh, completely valid as to why I haven't hit my bonus. However, the flip side to that, before I went into a managerial role and I was just part of the team and looking after my own set of books, if I hit my KPIs, and this goes for, I think, a, a lot of organizations and salespeople out there, if they hit their KPIs, they, they do get their bonus or some form of commission structure. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm in full agreement. I mean, as the manager, if their team hasn't collectively hit their um, sales target, yeah, the manager doesn't get theirs. And uh, but I, I haven't come across personally anyone as an independent salesperson as part of a team not getting paid their commission or bonus if they individually did achieve their KPIs and sales goals. Well, usually, what happens in a case like that is there'll be KPIs weighted at different for their targets. And then there'll be some other KPI for uh, maybe initiative or do a team or, so they'll probably be disadvantaged by a certain percentage because the whole team didn't make their bonus and then only get paid on their individual KPI. But the funny thing is, is like all the bonus structures that I've seen over uh, my time in executive search is that there are some cases where there's pooled bonuses and it's manager discretion yep on who on who gets that happened bonus. to me that happened to me is everything was achieved everybody was achieved but then the manager decided he gave everybody else the bonus and even though I was the leader of the team and I was responsible for achieving the bonus as the leader to your point Luke um, I didn't get the bonus, but everybody else did in my team. All my team members got the bonus, but as the leader, I didn't. His wow. discretion. So why didn't you get the bonus as the leader in your team? He wouldn't He wouldn't give me a good reason, and I left. I, I left within months of that happening. Oh, my goodness. So everybody in the team got the bonus, but you Correct. as the leader didn't get the, oh, Correct. I would love to have been there during that time. <laughs> <laughs> 
Get him put a hat right in there. How to win oh, friends and influence. Right How to win friends and influence people, right? Oh my God. Oh. Well, see, I think pulled bonuses are big mistakes because I'm a firm believer that numbers don't lie. And at the end of the day, it opens up too much room for personal biases for the yeah. manager to then I love, oh, I like this. Or, you know, remember I've said I'm mates with this person or they're my drinking buddy or. Or they think an achievement is somebody else's when it's been, you know, another person. So they, when you have a bonus structure, and this is why I think it's really important that managers should be listening to this, um, that they need to make sure that it is crystal clear what is required to get that bonus because measurable if it's gray you just upset so many people and the ones that get upset a lot of times are the high achievers because the ones who have done nothing they know they're not going to get a bonus and anything anything is a bonus to them but the high achievers if they haven't got the bonus that they think and it because it's all on the discretionary, well, they're going to be out the door. I've heard this story. They get very um, cross. Very angry. Yeah. So you have to be, think of um, think of Chevy Chase during National Lampoon Christmas. He didn't get his Christmas bonus. <laughs> or they set the, they and that's another thing, if they, you set the expectation of what a bonus is going to be at a certain time, and then you switch it, to something a lot lower, like, a, I, I don't know, do you remember that movie where he thought he was going to get a cash bonus so, so he could build the swimming pool and instead he got gift certificates? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think that's the I think that's the other challenge is so many of us have this expectation of the bonus and we've kind of spent it in our heads but, or we've pre-allocated it. Like we've paid, we've forward paid for this holiday or we've forward paid for something else when it hasn't even landed yeah, and mistake. then the amount you're expecting whatever and it comes out at one-tenth that, but you've already committed it and I've seen that happen <laughs> to a lot of people. I've seen that happen time and time again because organisations do do change things. Group performance doesn't work as well. So you think the pool is X and the pool is, you know, X minus 1,000 or whatever. You know, it's... Um, your bonus Missy. needs to be crystal clear exactly what it is that you need to do. And it's the responsibility of the employer and the employee to make sure that happens because it's your livelihood. And the other thing I've seen over the years a million times is overstating what the bonus is going to be. Like we pay X, Y, Z, plus you can earn up to 120 You can earn uncapped bonus. <laughs> and the reality is the, pe the, the people who or the companies that say, oh, you can earn up to 120 And I used to say to candidates, what is the track record of that happening before you take this role, before you go in there, find out if that 120 or 150% bonus has ever been paid to any people who have been in those teams ever and <laughs> then make a decision. And you, they find out that maybe 10% got paid. Yeah. You know, like it didn't get yeah. anywhere near what they were quoting. And it's like two, you know, two, and they, and they didn't, they weren't negotiating exactly what that meant in their contract. So they'd go, okay, you're going to get 150,000 plus we'll pay you up to 20% bonus um, based on performance measures. That's in the contract. But what they left out of the contract is what those performance measures and KPIs were. And so that's a big mistake. You should always find out, well, what do I have to do? Easy question. What do I have to do to get that 20% bonus? Because yeah, I and organizations will say, oh, we're right in the middle of strat planning right now. And um, all that's being reviewed and we'll have that all settled in the first three months when you're on board. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that never happens. Also, no. as a manager, maintaining integrity, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of corruption and pulling of strings when it comes down to to money. Uh, I've I've witnessed and seen firsthand some pretty pretty shady, dodgy scenarios. I mean, one example we we're obviously not naming companies here, but one scenario of a manager, what's called uh, Judith, you'd probably be aware of the term sandbagging. So sandbagging is alluding to the fact that you've got a team of potentially, let's say hypothetically, six salespeople. 
you know exactly what's forecasted to come in that month. If you're on a monthly KPI team target, let's say over 100 grand, um, you know that some people are, e are either falling short that month or actually having too many deals come in that month. They'll be skewing numbers month by month just to ensure that group targets made or having individual conversations with salespeople to say, hey, hold on to that deal for now, put that in for next month. You know, so I think uh, maintaining your core integrity and values as a human and not getting so blindsided by chasing the, the check and that, that dollar at the end of the rainbow is really important. Oh, and also from it's a so important. From a reputation for... standpoint anyway. Well, yeah, and it's important for the company to, because uh, it all starts from the top. Somebody's doing that, holding deals so that they can go into their next month figures or or bringing things forward that haven't actually been paid. They need to sack that person. But Judith, that's part it's, of the culture of these organizations. Uh, yeah, well, but oh, they, yeah, they also, all do it. It comes it's from the top. Embedded <laughs> in the culture. Yeah, I can um, I won't name them. Yeah, I know I know of one very large organization. It's a it's a global organization and this is just how they run their business. It is just how they run their business. Um, it's, it's, you, 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 you manage the sales, you, you even, even there's even allocation of some sales to different people to make sure that everybody in the team, if, if there are team targets, there's all sorts of crazy stuff. Why would, on. okay, I'm going to be the devil's advocate here. Why would any owner of a company be happy with somebody, um, not bringing the sales in as they happen or holding them back? For the next month, why well, I wouldn't be happy with that. If if my consultants did that, I would be really, really annoyed. Huge global corporations, they're sales machines. I mean, unless it's tax time, unless it's June and they wanted to go into next year's figures for whatever reason. It's but, quarterly. Yeah. A lot of these organizations got big quarterly targets. Yeah. And if they've met them, to Luke's point, if they've met them, they'll just hold over banking them until the next month so that they've actually got a yeah. kickstart yeah. on the next month's target because yeah, they run exactly. on quarterly cycles. And and also to add to that, they uh, they don't know, Judith. So the only one that knows is that, that bottom line manager who's got the team of six. You know, that team of six aren't skipping and going to their manager's manager, if that makes sense. So... The, the only person understanding or knowing that forecast that he's taken to his manager is that manager, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's what I was saying before, is that the from the top, if the top knew about that, I wonder how they'd actually feel about that. Because Oh, they, they would they would most likely uh, be, yeah, hand down a written warning for certain. Yeah, yeah, yeah because the, um, I mean, I've always been, it's like even with expenses, you know, when expenses come in, I've always been the type of person from a business point of view, pay it when it comes in, don't hold it off for three months to pay you. So it's false economy. And I've always thought of that with sales as well. If it comes in, it comes in this month, let's get it over because we got to go on to the next, we got to, you know, get the sales for next month and the next month after that. But I think from the, from the point of what we're talking about here is bone from a bonus point of view and negotiating your bonuses I mean, that really, in your case, Christina, you left the business. I left within three months. you I thought, gone. okay, they, they didn't, you know, my team made it. They got bonuses, but I didn't for whatever reason. Um, and I think in cases like that, that's where um, contractually it has to be stated in there. So when things like that happen, they can't not pay your bonus. You know, yeah. that it's in yeah. my bonus if my team makes if my team makes their target, that's part of my KPI, so I get X amount of yeah. bonus. And yeah. I think the yeah. point you make, Judith, there is I don't think any of us have ever been savvy enough around our contracts to look at that because it's a bit like, you know, it's a bit like a romance, right? It's a bit like you meet this you meet this new organisation, they look fantastic, you're excited, you can't wait to start, and you don't look at the little details that end up being the big details because you trust them, they're gorgeous, they're wonderful, and you believe them. That's a good um, analogy, yeah. <laughs> most and, people don't ask the questions because of excitement. Yes. And they just want, and actually, they just want the job too. Yes. They're like, I just want the job. Even if they've been headhunted or they, they still in certain, once they get excited about the job, 
they've mentally switched from their old company to their new company. So true. They, they don't, they, you know, they, they want the job. And so if they don't have an intermediary, like an executive search consultant or something working for them where they can ask questions, sometimes they'll miss important parts of the contract because yeah. the company has said, like you said earlier, Christine, oh, we're right in the middle of doing the KPIs. We, we'll have those. And then don't worry about it. We'll all be good. But most of the time, the executive search company is working on behalf of the client, which is the hiring entity, and they're given a contract. So like you're Sometimes. often, like, um, and I think it's always good to have someone else to to go to, to, to look at things, because I think we all glaze over with these contracts and we don't get as forensic. We, we well, don't. they're not they're not supposed to. I mean, when I was doing they're they're not. I know some probably do, but they're not supposed to just be working for the company at executive search level. Their role is to be the intermediary intermediary between the client and the candidate. Get the get the right candidate, because if they don't do the right thing by the candidate. And the candidate then, because that candidate is actually, that's the way I thought of it anyway, the candidate is just as much a client as the client, because one, they're going to go in there and they're going to run the next division. So I need to make sure that that they're happy with what they're doing. But But that doesn't mean that they shouldn't then make sure that contract is right as well and get a second opinion, because the recruiter, the executive search may have told them that they get something and then all of a sudden it's not written down into the contract and they need to have it written down like a car park, like a car park. So they, they might have, um, you know, uh, the, the recruiter might have said, yeah, you get a car park. There's one yeah. right there in the building. <laughs> oh, OK, that's great. It's not it's not in my contract. Well, don't worry, it's in the building. You have one. So then the company's yeah. car park policy changes. Or they move to another premises that has no car spots and they go, well, that wasn't uh, yeah, uh, Yes, it's been, it's been redacted, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So in everything everything you want better be in that contract, yeah, in writing. To Christina's point about how uh, you were mentioning, Christina, that you you left the organisation. I mean, that's all well and good when you've, when you've got other options to go to or you've got, you know, an abundance of cash flow on the side and, I'd stress that importance to employees out there, you know, from the employer perspective, how they say and coin the term, oh, we're always hiring. I think it's very important for each candidate or employee to always be looking because in a case scenario where the company or organization has done something immoral that just does not sit well with your values and morals, to be able to just jump ship and say, see you later, I've got other options on the go and I can actually go and do another paid role. But the saddest thing is the flip side to that is an individual that gets bloody hamstrung. They've got no options. Something yep. has been done by the organization that's immoral. And then they start sort of having to stay in this toxic culture and workplace that doesn't actually align with their values, which is the worst case scenario. Correct. The moral of the story is always be looking. Yes. That is so because to a certain degree, you still still got to fulfill your role. Yeah, you absolutely. Constantly, you can't just constantly be interviewing. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. We, we know you need mean. to always have you need to have people in your networks <laughs> that you need to constantly keep your networks up and have a few recruiters as well in your networks where that's where they become really handy to find out well what what is the current um market value what is the what is the average bonus out there for a similar role those are the people that should be able to answer those questions and if you don't have them in your network they're going to be kind of hard to do that um I knew and you'd I, bring it back to recruiters, Judith. Well, it does always, you know, but you got to have, I'm not even doing recruiting anymore, but I'm a believer in having the, the right ones in there because yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah. if they're in your industry, they know they've got their finger, you know, on the pulse and they know what's going on. They can give you a, a good idea to help prepare you for the negotiation Absolutely. because Absolutely. negotiations are, are, are more successful <laughs> when there's confidence there. And to yeah. your point, you have a plan B. So if you have a plan B and you know and you feel confident about your abilities and where you where you know you can go, then you'll go in there and you negotiate maybe a, um, a little harder or won't accept yeah. what they're telling you. And um, and I think that's that's important. You got to have that that. But if you're you know if you're um, 
you've got debt to the ceiling and you know you and you're barely making it and you're trying to feed your family and you don't have a plan b well then your confidence levels are going to be low in that negotiation because you don't want to upset the apple cart too much that's how you're going to feel going yeah, in there very mm. true and that's um i mean there's a lot of people out there too if we talk about going in and they're they're contracting currently with an organization and let's say they're currently on you know, hundred and six or two hundred thousand dollar contract, and now the company wants to offer them a permanent position. They're confused about okay, well, what do I do now? I'm on a I'm a do I'm on a two hundred thousand dollar contract. They want to offer me a job, so how do I negotiate that? I think that the whole that whole spectrum gets tricky from if you, whichever way you go because if you're coming in as a contractor to begin with well let's let's look at that transition of coming as a contractor then going from a contractor to an employee because i think there's lots of little subtleties in that coming as an in as a contractor usually they give you a daily rate and that daily rate and and this is where i've got tripped up I managed to re recover the situation, but what people don't often think about is you don't get holiday leave. You don't get sick leave. If you're not there, you don't get paid, right? So you get paid for the days that you show up. So you need to factor that in and you don't get bonuses, right? Yeah, you you yeah. don't get any of those things. So, um, and you don't work public holidays. So you're not working every single day that you're available to work. So you need to reflect that in your contract rate, um, and then as you're moving from that to, to the other scenario, your daily rate might be like you may be earning way, way more than, uh, the, than the employee in the same role might be earning, but they've got the comfort of the salary, whether they're sick, whether they're on annual leave, uh, parental leave, all those, they've got all those other benefits. So you yeah, it's it's a really interesting and a and a and a, and a challenging conversation to to navigate if you've been on a very high daily rate, and well, then you need now, to do, yeah, you need to do a total compensation comparison at the end of the day, and you look at what you're on now, and then how does how is that good when you're going into that nego new negotiation in there? That because more than likely it's going to be a lower base salary compared to your current contract rate. Absolutely. So you've got to look at things like, okay, well, what's the, do they have a health? Do they offer, you know, do they pay for uh, private insurance, health insurance? What's the superannuation cost? What about annual leave? Add all that. You have to add everything up to see if that package is going to be equal or better to what you're on now. And if it's not, then you might look at things like, okay, um, I'm currently on 200,000. What you're offering me is... Uh, when I add it all up, it's 180,000. And that's lower than what I, um, it's not acceptable. So what is acceptable? So that's, that's where you try to negotiate yeah. some of the things we were talking about last week, last week, things like, okay, well, maybe a sign on a sign on um, fee that will compensate me for um, the, the lower salary that you're going to pay. And then let's have a review in 12 months a salary review, whatever it is that you think that you, you always have to have a reason. If they're, if they want you to go, I can guarantee you this. If they want you to go from a long-term contract to a permanent position, it's because they think you're doing a good job. They've asked what you've been on. Let's, they you know, know you already. A month you're... by month interview for six months, let's say you've been on a, the longest interview ever. And now they want to offer you the job. They don't have to go through a recruiter probably because they may have already paid the recruiter for the contract. I don't know, but let's sometimes they do, but let's say they're not. Ask them if they're not going to give you, if that package doesn't add up to your, your contract, ask them for a sign on. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. And they'll go, okay, well, that's fair enough that you might get 15 as a sign on. But what is it is because if you take the permanent role and you still have in your head, you're not happy, that will affect your job performance for months and months and months. Because in the back of the head, your head, you'll be going, I'm not being paid for my value. And why aren't you being paid for your value? Because you didn't ask for it. Oh. <laughs> you didn't negotiate it and you didn't prove it. Oh, so yeah. 
quick quick you know? way to build quick way to build re, uh, res, um, resentment and uh, and a lack of productivity. Yeah. And it's not good. good for the company. The company needs to, as a company, they need to be open to that. They need to understand that's where, and maybe it is that you, the company might say, I'm sorry, the most we can pay you is 180. We, you're at, that's the top of the, but what else as a company can you give it? Christina, you mentioned that last time about money. Um, value is not all about money that it, it could be about ben other benefits, whatever benefits, ho extra holiday, whatever, That's to right. make you happy in that new role going into permanent, because it happens a lot. It's kind of try before you buy the contracts at the senior levels. I'm going to try this person out because it's beneficial for, in a way, it's kind of beneficial for the company because they can try you out and see how you're performing and whether or not. But the, uh, the risk to that as a company, you could take somebody on for a three to six months contact uh, contract, and then they get a good offer somewhere else, and they're in the middle of your contract mm -hmm. or your project. And so it is a risk that the company needs to weigh up. Are we prepared to do that? Are we prepared to take that risk? Yeah. Because they the terms usually in those contracts are similar to uh, a proper letter of offer where you, you have to give four weeks notice. So a contractor give give you four weeks notice, but that doesn't help the company because they're in the middle of a project. So employers need to weigh up whether or not it's worth giving somebody a long-term con uh, contract or try to get them on board right away. So there's kind of Luke, but, you've done you've done a lot of contracting. What are what are your kind of insights into going in and negotiating a contract in the in the first instance? What are the things that have that have been real wake up moments or aha moments for you? Yeah, hundred percent. I guess uh, I'm a bit of a novice. I've only been uh, in the contracting and consulting game for two two years, so it's all been um, phenomenal learning curves along the way. Um, yeah, and some some of those being, <coughs> yeah, not too dissimilar to um, being an employee in the sense of yeah, really going through with a fine tooth comb and understanding exactly what's in your contract. I mean, if I was to ask a majority of employees out there right now, this is dependent on uh, industry, obviously, but a lot in the media advertising roles, being either client director or enterprise sales manager, a lot of them are really only looking at uh, remuneration, salary, bonuses, that type in their contracts. But there's a lot of other very important things you've got to look at in, in your contracts. Um you know what what the ninety day uh, ninety day probation period actually means. Um, you know written formal warnings and you know the firing process and getting quite granular on that when you're allowed to leave. So yeah, ju just really going through and on a thorough level your your individual contracts. Um, from a contractor perspective, from from my end. Uh, really getting water tight on understanding the policies, legalities and everything of the organization you're contracting to, you know, that you, you might be given a contract from them, but it might not be, you know, completely aligned with actually, you know, the, the legalities from the, um, from, from, from their perspective, um, from an organization like corporate law and things like that. So if you do have the, the benefit of um, having any friends in your social network or corporate lawyers, um, taking them the contract and sitting down with them and really going through it and just just really understanding and and what that does though it just simply gives you a lot of wiggle room negotiation power and bartering power at the end of it. Um, so yeah, I mean that's my feedback. I mean I'm I'm new to the game and learning along the way, but yeah, there's been that great insights um, throughout. You know, sometimes companies will go, um, look, that's our standard contract. We can't alter it. That we can I can't change how they state the bonus structure in there or, or state um, any of that, right? So what would you do then? So what you would do, what what you that would be the quote, what would you do then? The reality is what you would do then is say, okay, well, can I at least have it in an email? Can I at least have what we agreed to in writing? Yeah. In writing in an email to say, yes, I do have a car park. Yes, I do have this is what we so that we each have an understanding that this is what it is. Because once you put something in writing, it becomes 
you, that someone can't then say, it didn't oh, no, you, misunder you misunderstood. You misunderstood. You know, that we, you know, that was only going to be the car park while we were in that building. Um, you know, <laughs> and, and, I, and, and I told you we were relocating. And so, so the thing is, is that once it's in writing, then the manager who's put it in writing is usually, unless they're really unethical or whatever, they're uh, is usually going to abide by it. And at least you have proof that there was a conversation um, attesting to that. Because we, Christina, some of those big companies, we know their their contracts are, you know, set in stone they're five pages long they've got you know standard yeah. clauses this that and the other thing and to try to get one changed would be almost impossible so right. things like you know your kpis and things like that you want you still want to get them in writing even if it isn't in the actual contract if you can't do it that way so you know you always it, do addendums right <laughs> yeah, they can. Well, they can. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. Something, something. If it's not in writing, it didn't happen. That's the way I look at it. Oh, that's so true. <laughs> that is so it's, true. Because that's what they'll tell you in six months. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And from a contractor perspective, the power lies within when it comes down to the fact that you've got other contracts in the pipeline or potential opportunities out there. I mean, you become a yes man and very vulnerable when you don't have other contracts. So when they come, if someone comes back and you're literally that's your only contract and you're not happy with it, you you've got no area to move into or or wiggle with or no power of negotiation. So moral of the story: have stuff up your sleeve and in your arsenal where you do have the power to either say no or negotiate. And also, too, I think people need to realize that. <laughs> When you are negotiating terms and conditions and you want things in writing, sometimes people will think, oh, they're going to think I'm pedantic or that I'm being picky or whatever. And the reality is quite the opposite because people will go, uh, from what I've seen, they'll go, oh, they want all this. They, they actually think they're more detailed. They actually, they might think, oh, what a pain. They might think that, but they think, that's exactly what I would have done. So good on them because they're hiring them for people who are attention to detail and are forward and are not afraid True. of that. True, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, I have been getting a lot of questions about taking contract roles overseas and what and some of the things that, that you should look for. So I, just, I did want to just cover that a bit because, mm. I mean, obviously the same things that you would look for in any other contract, but some of the things that you really, really need to be aware of, especially going overseas, is what is the cost of living in that country? Yeah, purchasing power parity. Yep, and their tax impl implications. And also, um, you know, the, is that compensation package going to cover that? Because often I'll see people under... Um, sell themselves as far as not because they think, oh, that sounds good. And then they get to this other country and rent is double what it was where they were or where they actually do a fall short on a lot of times is the relocation cost yeah. of their um, furniture, all their uh, good, their uh, partners and their kids oh. being flown over back and forth a few times, schools. Yep. All those, Space. all those different things, because it's a whole different ball game when you go into, and also where you're living, your, your, uh, where you're living currently, you want to live in the new country in a similar area. So you, so if you were paying six thousand dollars a month in uh, rent, well, maybe it's something similar in New York. Is going to be 12, 12 15. And it's a shoebox, you know. <laughs> so you really need to make sure that you do a lot of comparisons there when you're moving from country to country. And probably the biggest thing I would say to people is the comeback clause. So I'll go over there for a year or two or whatever it is. But when I come back, what am I coming back to? So you and know, the costs of coming back. Included. And the cost of coming back, my job. So if the company says, I want to send you over there and I want you to run this team for a year or two years or whatever, yeah, that's fine. But what am I coming back to? I want to be guaranteed that I'm coming back to a similar position or higher and that all the cost of coming back will also be, relocation will also be paid. But that is definitely one I would say to speak to people who have done it 
and in your networks on LinkedIn and stuff like that, if you know, if you're moving to Singapore, it shouldn't be that hard to find somebody in your industry who's in your country who's moved to Singapore that you could ask. Yeah, yeah. people are always happy to give you and some. Some, some industries are far more generous than than other industries. Some industries have got this down pat and they will do the whole package. It'll be relocation, it'll be a furniture allowance, it'll be we'll we'll cover your rent for a period of time, or we'll up the salary. You know, you need to then negotiate the salary to make sure it compensates. We'll pay your kids school fees all of those sorts of things, and other organisations just see what they can get away with. And don't just take what they tell you. You know, don't take Research it yourself. Yeah, research it yourself and, you know, ask around, ask other relocation consultants. Don't just take it on face value that that's what, um, that you know, that that's going to be all okay because. And also consider the currency you're being paid in as well. So, you know, there's yeah. currency issues and and different pay structures and different currencies. And so think about the currency and actually look at that and understand what the implications of that currency exchange is going to be for you as well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So um, now we were talking about earlier about whether or not we wanted to have a chat about entrepreneurs and how they should value their worth with contracts and clients. Christina? Yeah, I think that's that's a challenging space often is if you're starting out a new business or a new service and there's not something like what you already have or there's not a lot of comparison, actually understanding how to price and value that as you're going out and trying to negotiate a different style of contract. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just something that that we've been thinking our way through through more recently. And and how do you value what it is that you're doing. And there's that dance between you want to get clients, so you don't want it to be too expensive, but you want to actually get paid for what you're worth and you don't want to undersell yourself. So there's just this, there's just this bit of a dance. And I'd be interested, Luke, in your in your thoughts, because you've kind of been in a similar space. How, how do you price your value? Mm, yeah, it's a good one comes down to well, I, I feel it comes down to meritocracy, you know, how and and how and how good you are. Uh, your yeah, your your worth is is dictated by how um uh how in demand you are and how great you are and how um how uh, how the market is perceiving you. Um, not only from a reputation standpoint and working with you and and how how you how your clients are talking about how great it is to work with you but on the delivering quality of of the work and so when you have all that added well, what I call the sort of the the va the value bundle then um then coming up with your price should be should be should be quite 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 easy uh where you where you can go wrong though uh on the flip side to that is i guess probably probably list, listening too much um too much uh, around what people are saying out there in the market which could be what 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 people call sort of the hype train right in your sort of ego price if that makes sense mm -hmm. um versus <laughs> i guess it's like perception versus reality so coming back down to ground and, and that can be tricky and there's a lot of blurred areas, but, but fundamentally, but I, I think it goes back at the, quite similar to actually, sorry, I'm waffling here, but it goes back to quite similar, the terms and conditions and the negotiation power of when you've got a lot of contracts on the table. Yeah. You know, when you've got a lot of clients on the table and you've got your median average order value price and things like that, you know, you can start and, and then when that grows as well, and when the, like the larger deals are starting to come in, like when you're just starting out, right? You sort of you, you're just trekking away. You know, it could be three grand, four grand. Then it gets up into the tens and twenties, and then the project scope and the timeline changes, and the deliveries extend out. But you've got, I think, the importance is finding that sweet spot of. I mean, you're especially as an entrepreneur and a well sole contract, you're a one man band. You've only That's got right. a limited amount of output, right? If you haven't built a team. And so you've got to be like, right, well, you know, how many projects can I capably deliver in any given financial year and at what price where I'm not going to go into burnout mode, you know what I mean? So 
there's quite a lot to unpack. <laughs> there is there is a lot to unpack, isn't there? So nothing's ever straightforward in life and work. No, it's <laughs> no. not. And I and I think the thing is is that especially new entrepreneurs <laughs> who are, and if we say selling a service. Um, I think it's very important to, well, one, you need to understand the market and what, what you know, you're not going to be the highest and you shouldn't be the lowest. You're going to probably price it right in the middle somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and I think the thing is, is that don't do things it, like I know in my industry, yeah. when I, in executive search, when I was doing that, there were a lot of recruiters out there that were doing things on contingency basis. Well, I just think that is madness because you're doing a lot of stuff for free and then a lot of companies will use you for your knowledge and then they won't pay you and then you Correct. waste it. So quality is better than quantity and valuing your service. And you might say, I mean, I remember early on, I would say things like, okay, um, I know I'm not going to get the retain a third, 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 but if you take me on, I, I, I will charge a cancellation fee. If you cancel this, then there'll be a cancellation. So when I was building the business and trying to get the clients um, uh, to, to, to know our business and understand, then I'd say, I'll take the assignment. Or it's an exclusive assignment. If you cancel it for any other reason, there'll be X percentage cancellation fee. because And I priced it at the, enough that would cover the cost. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's a risk because I'm not going to never, I'm not going to not deliver the right candidate. So I, I had um, faith that we would deliver it. But it also meant, meant that I wasn't going to get clients who were just thinking, oh, well, I'll hire these three companies to go out and do a lot of work. And then I'll just find the, the right person myself. Just and cherry pick it and whatever. I'll just cherry pick it. So you have to, I think you have to be firm in your offering and you can and get it in writing everything again in writing like okay I'll do this work for you I do need I do need you to to sign our contract one you want them to understand it because a lot of people who are just starting their business are just so excited about getting that anything the lead or anything that they forget that they should be going into the steps. I forget about the money, honey. They forget about the money <laughs> and they go, oh, you know, I'm just excited. I'll do it. And, and those people will um, honor their word. Well, no, they won't because they'll go, oh, no, I never gave it to you. And I didn't sign anything. You know, there's no friends in business. Correct. You know, you, know, you get, you say, this is what I do and I do a good job and this is why I do it. This is the background. Here's the credibility. This is what we're going to do for you within this timeline. And this is how much it's going to cost you. Are you okay with that? Yeah. <laughs> good. Now sign here and I'll yeah. get started. Let's yeah. start. No, nice, yeah. nice trial closed there. <laughs> 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 And that I wonder why you smash your target. <laughs> <laughs> and it's never easy at the beginning, and you're gonna, you know, you're gonna fumble it, and, and you gonna... learn. You make mistakes. People take advantage of you, and you learn. You learn. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. And 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 thinking about the long game. Stop thinking about the short game. The long game, and understanding the shelf life of that contract. You know, so many going in for that short win, just money focus. But thinking about the long game and understanding exactly what that looks like, really understanding all your competitors out there from a contracting point of view, understanding what they're doing differently, what you can add to the table from a value perspective of what not what they're not doing, you know, your key differentiator, and then making sure that the client and their expectations and what they know, like if they've been dealing with someone in the past for the last 10 years across a range of different clients and the deliverables have been fairly the same throughout and you've come in and done something differently and really sort of exceeded expectations, really honing in on that. Like that's your unique selling differentiator. Make them aware of that. Um, and and because what that's going to do long term is ensuring that they just keep using you over and over again, repeat clientele. And those clients are there for life. Those are the ones you want. That's you don't want to be out there advice. just sort of, excuse my French, but slutting about the market just on these short-term contracts like that. That that A is going to be stressful. B, not really going to do wonders for your reputation. And C, uh, make you very exhausted and move into a likelihood of burnout. That's exactly. So look at it as a long-term relationship. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I remember when I very first started, mm -hmm. we had um, contractors out there working and, and um, I never did like the contract business from that point of view because it was just, it just, I didn't like it. But what I wasn't going to have happen is companies not paying for the contractors because in the industry at that time, it probably still happens. There were these big companies that would hire 10, 20, 30, up to hundred contractors, but then wouldn't want to pay, that wouldn't pay for three months. So, you know, immediately, um, that I was like, this is not going to happen. So if you want us to do contractors, we'll give you 10 contractors. It's going to cost X per month and you will pay up front. That's how we do it. You you pay us up front and then all the contractors are coming. And at first they'd go, what? Nobody does that. No, well, I'm not nobody. <laughs> at the end of the day, because I knew, I knew that if they didn't pay as a company, we're still responsible for those contractors, salaries. So we still have to pay the contractors. If a company, you hear um, during the recession, there were so many recruitment firms that went under because these big companies and and other companies that went under didn't pay the didn't pay the companies for all the contractors they had, but the contracting company was still responsible for that money because they would they they were the employer. They were the employer, and you know, and I thought I remember. I, I think I we did contracting for maybe two years and I went, nah, this is just, this is a hassle. They did pay up front. And if they wanted our contracts, they did pay up. But then I, we went straight executive search and that's a whole different ball game. Mm. But yeah, it, it's all <laughs> about- I'm going to go out and just run the show. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, it's all about as, a, as an entrepreneur, your livelihood is at risk every time you negotiate with a client. If you don't do it right, yeah. If you don't dot the I's and cross the T's, then you might be working six months for a client and they never pay you because you were too afraid to ask them and confirm the price, the services, get it in writing. Same thing with the bonus. If you don't get your bonus it's and you, you didn't ask for it in writing or get the details, well, and they turn around and go, yeah, but we, the company didn't really, sorry, but maybe next year. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we're going to increase the bonus structure. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> you know, so the moral of the story is... Stingling the carrot. <laughs> <laughs> see it all the time. The moral of the story, get it in writing, have a, con ha you know, be um, straightforward in your conviction understand the benefits that you need to ask for that you also need to get in writing um, understand what you need to do to get that's the biggest one what do you need to do for that 25 percent 12 months at the end of 12 months what do i need to do exactly can you just confirm it for me please <laughs> and, and if you do that you'll you'll you know you're going to live alleviate issues Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a great place for us to end this fabulous conversation. Luke, thank you so much um, once again for joining us and being the being the voice for the for the consultant. And uh yeah, exactly. thank you for and everything that you Don't forget to, to watch the Luke Farr show. Yes. <laughs> oh, thanks for the Bit plug, plug. Yeah, I, yeah. I was hoping it would come from um, yeah, not my uh not my bias mouth. <laughs> <laughs> We're not sure about the comment on LinkedIn about us being so old, but anyway, we'll deal with that offline. No, <laughs> I, I, wanted, I wanted to talk about that. That's from the website. It's from our my website. website. <laughs> I think those were your words, Christina. But we are, but, but we are older and wise. That's the wisdom. What, it's the wisdom. Wisdom. That's true. But yeah, but yeah, you're right. Like all of my network are thinking I've I've written that, and I'm sitting there going, "Oh no, she's that actually could be negatively damaging for my reputation." <laughs> oh yes, it's ageism. Ageism. <laughs> <laughs> Um, by the way, no, it's been a pleasure coming on. Thank you so much. Always enjoy our conversations and um, uh, look forward to the uh, inbox email with my invoice uh, for my time. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to negotiate. I forgot to negotiate and talk about that, right? It's well done, done Luke. The art of communication. Should have been in writing. <laughs> <laughs>
should have happened before the podcast, not after. <laughs> Correct. Prior planning prevents piss poor performance. Sure does. Oh, sorry, aren't you one of our new sponsors? Sorry, I thought you were. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Oh, shit. I don't think I'll ever be able to uh, outsail you, Judith Ben. <laughs> That's only because you've had more years on the tools. <laughs> That's oh. right. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> back, back to the ages of <laughs> wisdom, wisdom. Wisdom, wisdom. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks, everyone. Thanks. Yeah. thanks. Bye. Okay, bye. For more information about Every Step and our guests, head to everysteppodcast.com. To be notified of new podcasts, please subscribe via your favourite listening platform. And, of course, follow us on social media and direct message us to share your ideas about guests or topics.